how we're going to handle this. What's this going to look like? That's it. See, that's a bigger question than you thought. <laughs> What would you do about the reserve deputies? <laughs> the reserve program is a really good program. I like the program. But reserve, reserve officers, reserve deputies are there to supplement your force. And one of the problems I have with a lot of the way it was used is I think they were using like, some of the reservists instead of hiring and bringing in qualified deputies or commissioned deputies, they were using them to expand their budget. Not necessarily a bad thing, like at the fairgrounds and traffic control and places out like that. You know, things where, okay, we can use a reservist, an unpaid person that has a full <coughs> uh, working situation or public relations, uh, issues like that. Reservists have no place on the SWAT team. Reserves have no place in drug interdiction. They have no place in gang, gang investigations. And that was a lot of it. His family had taken the money from these people and allowed them to play where they wanted to play. They should not be making arrests on their own. Uh, on the Tulsa Police Department, that uh, was one of our basic rules with the reserves. Uh, you don't make arrests. You're writing, when you're on duty, you are writing with a commissioned officer. They, they don't do that. So that the reserves program is on hold right now. I don't want to get rid of it, but it's definitely got to be adjusted. I'm going to address this. Okay. Play a little devil's advocate again. Okay. Okay. Um, on the two eighty seven G that you're trying to continue, what happens? I mean, there's criminals in every nationality. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to have crap. So you have illegals in document that something something happened, something they did something. Now if you get away with that, what happens to them then? <laughs> do they sit there? Do they go through the judicial system? Like what's gonna happen with them? <coughs> that I asked uh, Sheriff Robinette. Uh, <laughs> uh, first, if they are arrested for drug or gang activity, things of that nature, for the kind of bank robbery, they are going to be held responsible and held to account for the crime here. You know, that's separate from the 287 G. Okay? Uh, if it's a felony, they're going to answer for it here. The only way I see that the 287 G might be a benefit is okay, this is a gang member with a bad history over here that the community is afraid of. Okay, he serves his time and now we're shipping him out of the country. But outside of that, no, they don't get turned loose. Now that I've said they don't get turned loose, I ask that question and ask for what happens now if I have one in here on bank robbery, he's under an ice hole uh, for deportation, but they decide that they haven't wanted to. Uh, moving, but he doesn't have the charges here, what do they do? And she said, we haven't really figured out what we're going to do on that one. So my issue on that is, my thought on that is, right now, 287G confuses the issue, push it aside, and we know what we're going to do, and it goes to prison. Yeah. Okay, now, here's the Rex summon. Is I've been involved in the law enforcement, I worked child abuse, child homicide for a long time, or what, with a lot of families where you're watching. Okay, here's here's dad and mom have been in prison you know, numerous times and the grandparents were, and then we have children. And you're going, wow, look, the grandchildren went to prison too. What a surprise. Uh, and seeing that when young children are not born into an atmosphere where they're loved and supported, and they're neglected, and they do not receive educational support. They don't receive emotional support. You're going to see an increase in mental illness. You're going to see an increase in, in your uh, juvenile justice system. You're going to see your prison getting bigger, and you're going to see your county jail getting bigger. The pathway that our state legislature is headed right now is a path to disaster. But here, I'll stand up and say, yeah, I'm a profit on that. That's a disastrous path. 
you know, so until people stand up and start screaming at our legislature and our governor, this is a disastrous route. Uh, I went to the uh, uh, presentation on it. It was called Cradle to Prison. Mm-hmm. And they did the statistics from around the world. It's the same thing. It's as predictable as the sun coming up tomorrow morning. So my biggest focus is on, first of all, let's take let's put as many resources as possible into the children, taking care of them, and our jails are going to shrink. How's that for some? <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, so I work actually with someone close, partner sometimes with the uh, sheriff deputy. Um, she's bilingual, and a lot of times she comes into the schools and is actually <laughs> able to be a friendly face with a khaki uniform. Um, but even though she's, she has a, her heart is in connecting with children especially, um, she has a hard time justifying her responsibilities or her, her, I guess, duties with going into the schools. And so actually just recently her new boss said that she can't go into the schools anymore. Um, so I'm just curious, have you thought about how the sheriff's department is going to work with the local education? This was called community resource office, so we just that fun mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what we did in the cops program. <coughs> I'm a huge fan of having community resource officers, school resource officers, pretty a round peg in the round hole in this case. And you know where she does the best, best work with her. That's her passion. She's an officer, she works in there. And great. And that. I guess my, how, how would that, I guess my, my thing is, I guess maybe, she, maybe it might be that she just, the funds aren't there that to, in, to incentivize that, or? Well, here's, you will often hear of funding being the issue. They always seem to find funds when they want. If they can find funds to pay a one and a half million dollars in law fee, a larger fees, or something with a cost of a hundred thousand dollars to prevent. No, let, let, let's cut that down. They always find money. Uh, and uh, I've, asked how, I've been asked, how would you uh, pay for some of these ideas you have? Uh, and this one I've already gotten a lot of pushback on. The Sheriff's Family Glands Memorial Training Center and financial fiasco. Uh, it was purchased, and uh, the purchase was approved by the Board of County Commissioners about three, four years ago. Yes. For 1.2, 1.3 million, I can't remember the actual number. We are still paying installments on that land of 37,000 a month or 400,000 a year. <coughs> to me, that adds up, it should have been paid off some time ago. Now, if we sell it, we just made possibly some profit and we put that back in the world. If we turn it loose, if we let it go into default, we save $444,000 a year. To me, that's a no-brainer. If we get rid of 287G, we save $500,000 a year. No-brainer. Here, we're, we can find the money for it when we want to. Mr. Um, so Vic Regalado has a lot of money and support, a lot of funding for his so how, and I know that that has been a horrible struggle for you. So how do you see yourself putting there's not a lot of days left in life of this? So what are some things that you're working on and how do people get involved with that? Uh-huh. You're okay, now lost a little bit. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, slow down just yeah. a little bit, much easier for you. Sure. So how do you see yourself winning given that there's not very many days left and how can people get involved knowing that funding he has the advantage to well, I have some of my team here that happen to be the people to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> like this lady here, the lady back over there, and that guy, and a couple of people back here. And they also have the little donations envelope, and anything helps. Uh, realistically, there's no way I'm going to match the money. You know, he's, I think it's a reasonable assessment by the time he's finished campaigning for the sheriff's office. He's going to spend close to $200,000. That kind of money does not come without strings. Mm-hmm. It's come from relatively handful of people. Uh, 
on the plus side, and my campaign just spent something like maybe fifteen thousand. I'm still in the ring. I'm still in the ring. He hasn't tagged me yet, so I consider that a plus. We're still in it. <laughs> uh, I think right now what I'm picking up is the, is the election is a toss up. It's going to depend on who gets the voters. That's what I think. You know, you know, convince your neighbors, drag them kicking and screaming with hair. No, don't do that. That's just common tactics. <laughs> <laughs> With the amount of money he's tossing out, I'm wondering if his polls have told him, you are in trouble. But people have gotten kind of negative. I'm surprised with the number of people that come up to him and said, I'm a Republican, but I'm voting for you. I'm a Republican, I'm tired of this, but you sound bloody. You know, so I think we have a chance. It just mm -hmm. depends on who gets the most numbers in that box. So. That's it. And what I also one question I've been asking several times. And at first my answer was no. Of course my first answer was well when they said, Well, you weren't for sure was no. <laughs> but, uh, will I consider running if I lose? And my first thought was on that, just I've been beat up enough on this, I'm tired. You know, no, but if the number of people has been encouraging and donating small amounts occasionally large enough. Uh, 